Oh, Hollywood Squares, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, well, so welcome, everybody. I'm going to uh, come in. It's a. Uh, oh, we have to have the same. <laughs> clock. Um, so I just want to let you know that the entire session is recorded. Just a reminder about that, and so that you're aware of that. Um, do not hold back in terms of sh sharing in that. We're not turning the recordings into the FBI or anything like that. But uh, <laughs> but I think it's important to know that so that you're aware of it. And we've chosen to do this class that I'm doing in that way where we record the entire thing so people can interact uh, while I'm going through uh, the presentation even. Uh, and we'll, uh, there's good arguments to do it different ways on Zoom, but we're, we're trying to do that this way. I have checked, the outlines are all right. If you go to the uh, home page of the website and go down the uh, right hand corner and there's outlines for the first three sessions, including this one, if you want to have that uh, while, while I'm going through it. Uh, and then also there's two recordings there for the sessions one and two, the previous two sessions. So, so you know that, that and it's, it's really, once you get to that home page and go down there, I found it real easy to click on it and get, get what I wanted. Um, so today what we're going to do is focus the, the overall theme is telling the truth in political campaigns. A little, little odd in a way, but I'm going to begin with uh, you know, in Nazi Germany. You can look at Bonhoeffer again, but in Nazi Germany, uh, after six months, there were no more votes. Hitler was in power. Um, but obviously political influence was still important. You still had to worry about public opinion to some degree. You can't, uh, even though he imposed a lot of things, you still had to have enough people willing to go along with it. But we're going to start with Bonhoeffer's experience of being interrogated after he was imprisoned, interrogated about his role in the conspiracy and the difficulty of telling the truth in that situation or what does it mean to tell the truth in that situation. Um, the main essay that I'm drawing on for some of the insights from Bonhoeffer is called What Does It Mean to Tell the Truth? Uh, it comes from volume 16 of Bonhoeffer's works, uh, which is the one that I, uh, the one where I was the volume editor for that particular. So this is a very key essay, and I'll be able to share with you the key, some of the key points uh, that come out of that, and a little different take on what it means to tell the truth. Uh, and I think, I think you'll find it helpful, and it will also help us understand uh, some of the frustrations with uh, politicians uh, when it, they may even try to tell the truth and not be able to tell the truth at time. And then if we really look at it closely, we all run into this. You know, telling the truth is not simply a matter of not lying. Uh, and, and so we'll, we'll pick that up today uh, going through this. If we were in the fellowship hall, around tables in there, the priming the pump question would be, as I put at the beginning here, how do Donald Trump and Joe Biden compare on the Pinocchio test? All right. How do they compare on that, uh, on the Pinocchio test? Uh, obviously, there have been a lot of issues with the president about his uh, ability to tell the truth. But I just saw a, a part of a presentation by CNN on Joe Biden and the path to the presidency. And Joe Biden ran into some troubles, uh, you know, 30, what is it, 30 some years ago, uh, where he was accused of plagiarizing in one of his campaign speeches. Uh, and so again, another form of not being truthful. Um, so what, what are the more, you know, what are the more destructive consequences of the way we speak? That's part of what we're trying to get at today. So let me, uh, let me begin. Uh, if I'm going to encourage everybody to mute, if you want to ask a question or bring in a comment, you can try raising a hand. Um, Pastor Robin will help maybe find those for me uh, uh, and don't hesitate. And if you have to, just unmute and just speak up until we hear you, all right? And we'll, we'll do this the best we can. So let me begin then. So Bonhoeffer was arrested in 1943, in April of 1943, uh, and, and in prison then. And so he uh, reports several times uh, in November and December of 1943, approximately five, six months after he was arrested, uh, that he's working on an essay called, What Does It Mean to Tell the Truth? And he began writing this essay when he was being interrogated 
by a senior military prosecutor named Man Manfred Roeder. Um, and so he is being interrogated. That's, that's the conditions under which he is responding to questions. Uh, and the initial focus, they didn't know at that point how involved Bonhoeffer was in the conspiracy. So what they were really initially focused on was Operation 7, and this is where Bonhoeffer uh, helped, and some others helped 14 non-Aryans, so Jews, people of Jewish descent, travel to Switzerland under the pretext that they were working for military intelligence. And Bonhoeffer had been working for military intelligence, basically for, he, he was a spy, or we would call him a double agent uh, for what he was doing but he had connections to military intelligence. And so that was the, the, the um, sort of the ruse to, to get these non-Aryans to Switzerland is that they were working for military intelligence. So we're using them for military intelligence. The biggest concern of the Nazis were there were some currency irregularities surrounding this Operation 7. And it really helped because the Nazis figured that Bonhoeffer and his brother-in-law and some others in military intelligence were as corrupt as they were. And so they were engaging in and trying to line their pockets. And um, so that actually helped help uh, maintain some of their cover. Um, and the, the idea was that they were saying this was an effort, effort to sabotage the government deportation policies. So a little different, you know, we're dealing with deportation issues here. This, this was one of the, the issues there. Uh, when, when that didn't go anywhere, when Roeder couldn't pin Bonhoeffer down with that, then he tried to demonstrate that his, um, it's called a UK classification, which is the equivalent of being, a, it's a classification where you're doing some occupation that is so essential to the war effort that you don't have to be drafted and serve in the military. So we have people with that kind of classification in our time too. Um, so that was this classification. And Roeder was trying to show that this classification was given to Bonhoeffer, who was working for military intelligence in a civilian role, to show that that was a sham. Um, and as I say here, he was working as a courier for military intelligence, and Bonhoeffer's job was to communicate through foreign church leaders uh, with allied leaders. So Bonhoeffer had good ecumenical connections with people outside of Germany, and so they were, the idea was they're putting those to use. Um, it's another issue, but there's a wonderful series of letters where Bishop Bell from England, who befriended Bonhoeffer, is talking with Anthony Eden, the Secretary of State for Great Britain, trying to say, uh, and Bell is sticking up for Bonhoeffer and others in the conspiracy in Germany. But finally, Anthony Eden just said, we're not trusting any Germans. And so they gave him no response. Turn the volume up. Um, so the, we're not going to trust any any Germans. Um, uh, then the other thing that Roeder was trying to show was that Bonhoeffer was trying to help other pastors avoid military duties. So here, here's the, what's critical about this is Bonhoeffer, if you look at his testimony in when he's being interrogated, from just a straight point, was he telling the truth? One could make a case he was lying through his teeth. Um, and why was he doing that? He was concerned about, he didn't want to expose any of his family members. He certainly want, did not want to expose the conspiracy. Um, and so he's trying to protect the conspiracy, his family members and all that. And so he is not what we would normally think of as telling the truth, he's not doing it there. And so it raises the question, what does it mean to speak a truthful word? Um, is, is it truthful when you always just tell the truth, no matter what, you never lie, or it is a truthful word may be a word that ends up protecting more people, or in this case, protecting a movement that was geared toward getting rid of, you know, one of the, perhaps the most notorious dictator in, in the history of the world. So, so it's, telling a truth is not always a simple matter, is what, and he's working on this essay while he's involved in, in this interrogation. Uh, there's, there's a scene, there's a movie that was made about Bonhoeffer called Agent of Grace. Maybe some of you have seen it. Um, and there have been some of the Bonhoeffer types had a hard time with the movie. Um, but I heard the movie director just, when they, he was asked by these scholarly types, 
why he made this movie. And he said, I'm a movie producer and director. He said, I make movies for entertainment. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, there is a scene in that uh, movie, which probably was his, um, the director's imagination, but you can imagine this, where Roeder, this prosecutor for the Nazis, finds out that Bonhoeffer had been lying to him. And he just, he comes up to him and says, how could you have lied to me? It was just, you're a pastor, you know, how could you do this? And he is just totally offended that Bonhoeffer would lie to him in the, when he was uh, interrogating him. Uh, that came out later, uh, you know, not, not right away. It came out later and was obviously one of the key reasons why Bonhoeffer was finally hung by the Nazis. Um, Bonhoeffer originally planned this reflection on the eighth uh, as a, re uh, a reflection on the eighth commandment: "You shall not bear false witness." Uh, and so, what does it mean to bear false witness? Uh, he he did not address all the topics he hoped to in this essay, so it's about eight pages, and it was planned to be much longer. But that's how much he got written in the circumstances that he was in. Um, then the last point I want to make in this section is that. Hitler and the Nazis were masters of what's called the big lie. And you tell something, you repeat it often enough, it's so preposterous, uh, and finally it's amazing how often you can get people to swallow big lies. Um, and I, I suspect, um, you know, we've been dealing with that issue uh, certainly in the last four years, where sometimes things are said that are just plain big lies. And a lot of people or enough people swallow them um, or don't care. Sometimes they don't care. Uh, and, uh, but that was, that was something that was the, the Nazis were noted for, telling the big lie. So Bonhoeffer, when it comes to telling the truth, then let me just give you some of the highlights from this essay. Uh, and then we'll tie it into the current, current situations in terms of political campaigns. So one key thing about telling the truth, he said, is it's contextual. You have to look at the context in which the word is being spoken. It's not just a matter of this line is true or this line is false. What is the context in which it's being said? Uh, it's important to pay attention to what's, what's your intention when you speak that word. Um, it needs to be based on an accurate perception of what's going on. And you have to give serious consideration to the real circumstances that you're involved in. So for example, when you're being interrogated and your family could be, their lives could be at stake and their well-being, you're part of a conspiracy. Fortunately, that's not something that we, uh, most people ever have to face, but um, you have to take the context and the real circumstances into consideration. Um, you know, right now in our current situation, we have a whole variety of things going on that we have to deal with um, that are all part of speaking the truth in our time. Uh, you've got racial unrest, political division, uh, economic stress, pandemic. We've had wildfires here. All of these factors of where we're located may end up impacting what it means to say a truthful word in our, in our context. And then you can imagine all the in, within families or uh, congregations and communities, there's a variety of other factors at play that can affect uh, uh, the telling of the truth. Another key point, he says, truth, telling the truth is something we must learn how to do. So it could be, for example, that somebody simply isn't mature enough or has, doesn't have enough life experience or they don't have enough grasp of what's going on. It, even if they wanted to tell the truth, they're not capable of telling the truth because they don't have uh, they haven't learned how to do it. And I, again, I'm not just talking about being taught not to lie. This is, this is learning what's going on in the world and having a grasp of reality. Um, Bonhoeffer warns about what he calls zealots for the truth, that just, you know, I'm going to tell the truth no matter what. Um, he said that can be. Uh, and frankly, growing up, I, was, I had a little bit of that in me. I always told the truth. I, I never lied. I really did not. <laughs> and what, what Bonhoeffer, is, that's great. In one sense, that's great to, to learn to tell the truth in that way. And certainly I taught my kids, you know, to tell the truth. But when it comes, you know, the more you get involved in more complicated situations, it may not be that simple to simply say, I'm going to tell the truth 
and no matter what. The classic example from uh, the philosopher Immanuel Kant, he once said that if somebody comes to your door and you've let uh, uh, a friend of yours come and hide in your back bedroom, I'm loosely telling you this story, and somebody comes to the door and they're looking for your friend who's in the back room and said, is, is so-and-so here? Do you know where he is? And you said, well, you don't want to tell a lie. So you say, yeah, he's in the back room. And the guy goes in and, you know, hurts him or something like that. Bonhoeffer is saying that's ridiculous. Obviously, the truthful word there would be a word that protects your friend who's in the back room from uh, being harmed. Um, but Kant's concern was that if we start saying, well, it's okay not to tell the truth in that case, he was concerned about a slippery slope where all of a sudden you start, well, I'm, you, so you kind of explain away why you're saying this. Well, I didn't want to do this. And it's very easy to go down what he called the slippery slope. Um, and so that's, that would be Kant's critique of people to say, he said, uh, if you're going to lie in that situation, what's going to keep you from lying in other situations and, and trying to justify your, your not telling the truth? Um, Bonhoeffer uses the term living truth. And so truth is something, this is hard because we think of the truth. If it's true today, it should be true tomorrow. But it's possible that truth evolves and grows or we grow in our ability to express the truth, uh, again, to learn to tell the truth. Um, so that it's a concept of living truth. You see the danger here. I mean, this is why Kant was concerned. Living truth could easily become what whatever I want the truth to be. That would be the extreme of this. And so it, it's... There is a balancing that goes on there. Uh, Bonhoeffer was very concerned about what he called an increased uh, profligacy, uh, a reckless extravagance of public discourse is the term he uses. And um, we are dealing with that big time in our culture for the last several years, just reckless public discourse. And I'm not just accusing the president of that. I think that We've seen reckless public discourse in a lot of different ways in our culture, and also the amount of public discourse. And part of this is the challenge of social media even, is the way we've seen people can just start a website and put out whatever information they want. And so we're, this is a tough time uh, because of what I would call excessive, excessive public discourse perhaps. Um, again, it can be helpful to have all these different sources, but at the same time, it can be a challenge for us. And Bonhoeffer speaking in a time without social media, but again, the Nazis were notorious for being, uh, just putting out very, uh, just a public discourse with a lack of integrity and that, and, and, and with strong consequences to it too. People died because of the way they talked about things. Uh, people are dying because of the way uh, our public discourse has gone in recent, recent years. So a typical definition of lying is uh, uh, a conscious contradiction between thought and speech. So this is what I know, but I say something different than that. Um, and where you consciously deceive others and it ends up having negative consequences. So uh, that's a more typical understanding. Bonhoeffer, again, he's not just throwing that out completely, but he says the real issue is about What's, what's real? What's really going on here? And he would say, we have people of faith, we got to take into account God, Jesus Christ, Jesus' teachings. Um, and so he comes up, it's, it's, you know, it's, this is a scholar writing this, but uh, he says, he defines um, lying then as the negation, dot, denial, and deliberate and willful destruction of reality as it's created by God and exists in God to the extent to, that it takes place through words and silence. So just to break this down, if our words actually end up, for example, let's take um, the environment or ecological concerns, um, lying would be to say untruthful words about what's actually going on um, in terms of our relationship to uh, ecosystems, the natural world and so on. And to deny climate change right now, um, that is, it's not just a form of, I don't agree with that. In fact, scientists would make a case that that's actually just false. It's false word, false speech. And so that's, that's the problem there. And you end up, and there are destructive consequences to it. Um, 
and, and, and notice, again, people may be trying to say the truth as well as they give, can given what they know. Finally, you know, we're, we have to speak from what we know and who we are and our experience in that. And so uh, rather than just saying you told a lie, it's saying, you know, that's, you, I know you're trying to say the truth here, but I don't agree that that's the truth. It changes the way, in a good way, it can change the way we come at truthfulness. Uh, and, and so I know you think that's true, but here's why I'm concerned about what you just said. Here's what I think the consequences of that. So it changes the way we come at it. So how does my word become true? Uh, by recognizing who calls me to speak and what authorizes me to speak. You know, in, in terms of we seek as people of faith, we're attempting to follow Jesus, but we utilize a lot of sources of truth in trying to follow Jesus. We can use science and all the other sources of truth that can be helpful to us. Um, an unconnected word, Bonhoeffer says, is hollow. So if we just think, here's this statement, and it's not connected up with the, the, our context and the, where we live and where we move and have our being, so to speak, uh, it does not con contain truth then. The justification for speaking emerges from my office or role, and so we also pay attention to, we have a role, for example, as parents. And so then we speak as parents in a given circumstance. Could be a teacher. Uh, our political leaders then have a particular role and a particular responsibility, and that needs, they need to be aware of that as they speak. Uh, certainly when we have somebody uh, talking about things, we say, well, that's not the way uh, uh, a senator or a representative or a mayor or a president should talk. That's some, because that's some, that's, we have a way of understanding their role and we're critiquing that they are not fulfilling their role in the way they are speaking. Uh, they're not being, they're, they're, they're public servants. So they're, what, what they say should be serving and helping and supporting the common good. And so we get frustrated when it looks like they're not fulfilling their role in, in what they say and what they do. We need to recognize the place in which we stand again. Who are you? Where do you live? Context in which you work and live and move and have our beings. Um, and so we're, we, really pay attention to context. And speaking then has, we pay attention to our mission when we speak, to the time in which we speak, the place, and also to the limits. And so we're aware, I'm speaking this word, but we're aware that we don't know everything as we speak it. And so we have some humility when we speak about what we know. All right, so let me just then lift up Three implications, and there are more, but three implications for political campaigns in our context. One is some candidates are incapable of telling the truth fully because they lack an adequate grasp of reality, the reality of our situation. And I'll just be blunt. That is something our president really struggles with, but he's not alone. He's not alone on this. So he has a, because he's the president, though he has a major responsibility to speak the truth. So. You know, and I, I've, I've almost felt, um, I don't know if sorry for him is the word, but he really struggles. You know, we've, we expect presidents to be, when there's a tragedy of some kind, to come in and say that comforting word. Um, you know, uh, President Obama was very good at that. I, I thought President Bush was quite good at it, too. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan was good at saying the comforting word, as I recall. Um, Jimmy Carter. So most, most presidents, Bill Clinton was, most presidents have been able to fulfill that role pretty well. That is an extremely difficult role for President Trump to uh, fulfill. And, and uh, he, you know, he, he tries, but it's just, it's just not something given who he is and where he's at and what he focuses on. He just doesn't do that very well. Um, and, and he's not going to. So it's almost futile to just beat up on him for not fulfilling that role. He's just unfortunately not very good at that. Um, and that's one of the things we expect out of uh, a president. Um, then a second one then, the lack of involvement or silence of citizens in the political process can be a form of not telling the truth. So if we are quiet and uninvolved, um, that actually is a form of not telling the truth. Normally, we wouldn't say you're lying when you're not involved, but you're not 
expressing a word that needs to be said in a given circumstance. And, all, and that again depends on who we are and, and uh, who we're connected with and so on. But uh, silence can be a form of not telling the truth. And then finally, beware of zealots for the truth. People that have it all figured out. And we've seen zealots for the truth on the left, we've seen them on the right. Um, you can probably have zealots for the truth that's right down the middle even. Uh, but it's people, they're so sure of themselves and they just, they'll almost beat you over the head with the truth, um, of whatever the consequences are. And so it's, it's not just a matter of having the right ideas, it's what should form those ideas take in a given time and place. That applies to big picture politics. It applies in um, our homes. Um, you know, if you wanted to interview our children, they could name several things that they thought we were way too zealous about. We, we weren't lying in a traditional sense, but they just say, you guys focused on that so much and you were ignoring some other things. You know, um, so it, it can happen in a variety of contexts. Can happen in congregations, obviously, where we may get onto something and we're so onto it that we're forgetting some other things that are going on and we lose, lose an awareness of the full picture of what's involved. Uh, congregations often have trouble facing the truth in terms of when they're maybe reaching a point where they can no longer go on as a congregation. Uh, it's a very hard time for a congregation to reach that point. Um, but again, we will miss what we're actually being called to do if we're not look, looking at the full reality of what we're involved in. And it's really important during times like challenging times like that in a congregation to have somebody that's able to speak a truthful word. I won't out Scott Taylor, but I think Scott Taylor, from what I understand, I wasn't involved with it, was, did an excellent job in being the president for Light of Life when they went through the process of closing. And, uh, uh, and I think he was a trusted voice through that time. Not much fun to be the co council president when you're closing down a congregation, but somebody had to approach that in a, in a truthful way to get through that. Scott, I based that on only, uh, they weren't rumors, the, the assistant to the bishop even affirmed that for me, but that was my perception of what was going on there. <laughs> All right, so the last discussion question I have there, what other implications of Bonhoeffer's concept of telling the truth do you see for the current presidential campaign? So any comments, questions, concerns you have, but again, our focus is what does it mean to tell the truth in the kind of context we're in right now? Uh, and again, raise your hand or just unmute and speak up. Uh, Luann. Well, you know, Woodward's book made it very clear that um, an inadequate or lack of grasp of reality of our situation has not been the reason we have approached COVID in, in the way that we should have. And, and so Trump knew, and yet he didn't share that. And I, I, in terms of kind of zealots for the truth, I, I totally understand that there are times when our political leaders have to, have to not share information because of national security. Not yeah. everybody should know everything. And but this is not a this was not a national security issue, and in fact, in that way, it was a national security issue in which people really did know, need to know the truth. Yeah. No. Oh, well. Well said. Other comments or questions? Uh, Claudia. Well, when when a person lies as as much as our current president does. It's like, what can I really believe? You know, and you question everything, which you should question anyway, but you can't put any stock in what he says. So I've, I've used the image of when, when we don't know who to listen to or who we can trust, or we don't have confidence in what we're hearing, in a sense, it's like the ground is moving under our feet, you know, and, and so there is some sense it's, and so we're just, it's very unsettling to, to try to function in a situation like that. Now we have to deal with our limits 
obviously we're never going to know everything and be fully aware of everything that's going on. But boy, when, when that just the basic stuff that you're hearing uh, and you, you can't count on it, uh, it re makes it really difficult. I, I've noticed that with the CDC now. I mean, I think the confidence of people in the CDC has really been compromised uh, because of a whole variety of reasons right now. And so we want, well, do we listen to this or don't we listen to this? Um, and figuring out who to listen to is one of the challenges. We've talked about this before, but that's one of the major challenges before us is who are the trusted voices we're going to listen to? And I, I can give you some, I could give you my opinion on that, but finally that's a challenge growing up in any time is who are the trusted voices you're going to listen to in, in your life? Um, and and I think some of the trusted voices that we've listened to, the CDC, the FDA, the EPA, the National Weather Service, all of those have been compromised. Yeah, yeah. Even the National Weather Service. <laughs> oh, dear. Other comments or questions? Uh, Lynn. Um, I would also say that I think our media is guilty of what kind of the, the, the zealous truth down the middle because they give equal weight or they're trying to give equal weight to, you know, one position and then they feel like they need to provide airtime to the opposite position, even when the opposite position is something as horrific as like Holocaust deniers or something like that. Yeah. And, and so I, I would place some of the blame for not knowing what to believe because they're presenting both sides as equally valid. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that has partially led us to where we are in terms of there's a large number of people who don't believe anything anybody says. No, I, I, it's very insightful. And I'd also do a critique of, I tend to approach table talks where we're going to be respectful of everybody's voice. And there's something good about that. But there is also some, could be some naivete in that. Um, because there are times when no, somebody may just say something that's flat out not, well, they may even be trying, somebody could come into a table talk, for example, and just try to manipulate people there. And they wouldn't, so it, it may, I make the assumption that we're all going to be respectful and civil and so on and doing that. But a lot of times we're fighting this out in a context and certainly in the political campaigns in recent years have tended to be very divisive. And so it, it is tricky. And so it's not just a matter of, well, this side says this, this side thinks that. We have to do more than that. Um, uh, one, one last thing on the media, media thing that I'll respond because it came to me while you were talking is one of my critiques, uh, in this case, I'll just name a name here of CNN. And I, I tend to listen to CNN quite a bit. Um, but there is, a with many of the reporters, there's what I kind of call the gotcha thing. And it's like, if we can say, here, he did it again. He told another lie. And it's almost like, now we've done our job. Well, no, there's a lot more that needs to be reported about what's going on right now. It's not just a matter of gotcha. You need more analysis and, and that. And, and there are people trying to do that. Um, and so it's really, and again, there's no easy way to do this, but it's really important for us to find who are those voices to listen to that we can trust that are to the best of their ability are trying to give us an accurate read on what's going on. I, I like to look for voices where people are saying things you wouldn't expect from somebody who was from that political party or was not mm -hmm. from that point of view. Or So people are saying some things that you normally wouldn't expect to hear from them. Um, I, I tend to really look for that uh, as I'm trying to figure out what the truth may be in a given situation. Other comments or questions? concerns. Uh, Peggy, well, and then Mary after. Uh, okay, um, uh, something like peeling the onion. I forget who used that analogy uh, recently, but um, 
every there's gamesmanship in everything. Everybody has two or three agendas. Um, and that's that's the way it is. That's more truth about the situation in the flat first statement, you know, it's a and it's hard for just uh, people that watch the evening news or whatever to have any kind of grasp about the, about the whole game that's going on. So you you've got people that are thinking about an election four years away or you're or they are trying to get this set of voters tuned in to them so they'll offend somebody else just to make them happy and it's there's there's all these levels of gamesmanship that make you know what is truth what where is the truth in any of this stuff i, I guess my, that's my comment yeah no that's it's that's what's going on and so we have to be aware of that there's yeah. mary so about four years ago it was during the last campaign and I felt the ground moving under my feet and was trying to decide where, you know, where can I find out what's real and not totally slanted. And I found um, a graph on, on, on the internet that took all of the news um, venues and put them on a left to right scale. So, um, and it had, you know, for example, Breitbart would be way, way over on the right. Um, Daily Beast and Vokes were more on the left side, you know, and you got closer to center so that uh, public broadcasting was still a little to the left of center and uh, Fox News was still pretty far out to the right. And you get down to the middle and there were, um, you know, you get the New York Times and the Washington Post was a little to the left and this and this and this. And that's when I started subscribing to the New York Times. Um, but um, anyway, it, it just kind of helped, it helped me, think, okay, uh, and, and, you know, CNN is a little to the left, too, um, and not that they aren't good, uh, you know, sources, but it's nice to know who you're listening to and who you're reading. Yeah. I think it's also important that we just don't use TV and internet sources, but we use the written word, like the New York Times or the Washington Post, or, or look at those things that are being... That, that are written because they give more, much more nuance than you get from a TV report. Yeah, when I was in college, I did a class, I'm, I'm here, I did a class that um, you had to look at the same story for several weeks, different stories in three or four different periodicals or books or, or newspapers and see how that story was different in all of those different sources. And some, of course, they didn't even cover that story. And what I found in that analysis that I did for that class was the only one that was really straight shooter was US News and World Report. It was the only magazine, Times, Newsweek, um, I forget what other one I read, um, was, uh, was really neither side. They told both sides of the story and let you make your own decision. And you know, I haven't seen US News and World Report anymore. Is anyone else? Boy, I'm trying to remember. I, I can't remember details on that. Yeah. Um, anyway, it, it's been going on forever because I did my class back in 1976 or 79. So that was a long time ago. But it's been our problem since then. I think it's only gotten worse with that. But yes, like Mary said, you know, seek out the one that, that's kind of in the middle. And to what Lance said, the written word is a better story than the seconds that you get on, on TV news? Well, it, it tends to, uh, when we take time to read something, it, you could do this with social media too or with television programs, but when you read something, it tends to slow you down and make you just help us be more thoughtful about things. And uh, so again, you, we could do that with, but, with social media, TV, and everything else too. It's just the nature of it. You hear it, and then you're on to the next thing. And um, so I, it, it, helps, it helps to have thoughtful people. I'll just lift up one name. I think I've used his name before, but I found him very helpful on uh, some of the racial issues, but also on political stuff. He's just a savvy guy, is Van Jones. Um, and you see him on CNN. But Van, Van Jones is willing. He says some things that aren't just 
it's very clear he's been really, really thoughtful about what he's talking about. And uh, so, so that's one, one example of somebody that I appreciate who's a TV person, a TV commentator, but it's very clear that he's, he's quite thoughtful about it. One other example, um, I just want to share, I've told this story before and so, uh, about Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi was known for his experiments with diet and so on, but he has a mother come to him and says, I want you to tell my son not to eat sugar. And Gandhi says, I can't do that, but come back in a week. So she comes back in a week and he says, I still can't tell your son. She said, kind of like, why not? He said, just, he said, give me one more week, come back in another week. So she comes back in the next, and it's been two weeks then since she first talked to Gandhi. And he says, yes, now I can tell your son uh, not to eat sugar. And she said, well, why couldn't you have told him that two weeks ago? He said, because I had to see if I could go for two weeks without eating sugar. Um, what I'm getting at again is that whole learning, even to get, it's, it's not exactly what we think of in terms of truthfulness, but he wasn't ready to speak to this woman's son until he had seen whether he himself could go without sugar. Um, sometimes we may not be ready to speak yet. And it's hard because sometimes we have to speak before we're ready. So at 8.30 this morning, Pastor Robin, for better or for worse, needed to preach to us. So that there's a discipline about having that time where you need to preach so you do the best you can and you reach that point and you're on to, to speak. And you know, last week it was me having to do that. Um, imagine being politician and you have people coming you all of the time wanting you to say stuff just like that and it's a challenging position to be in. I'm not trying to let all politicians off the hook here, but that is the nature of things where they're expected to be on top of things uh, and be able to speak right now, and we want to hear a truthful word. Um, that's a big challenge. Pastor Rob. Really appreciate the encouragement towards thoughtfulness. I really don't think Jesus would have fit very neatly into any particular frame that I might be familiar with, and he probably would have been, you know, right in line with, with certain groups or parties on certain things, and then challenging on other things, because that's just who he is in the, in the Gospels. Um, I, I also want to be careful not to conflate thoughtfulness, though, with being in the middle, because I don't think Jesus was in the middle. Uh, yeah. I was, I was, there's a part in the gospel passage for today where the children are in the temple and they're, they're running around yelling Hosanna to the son of David, which they probably had just heard as, you know, when he came in on the, on the donkey. And uh, I was trying to think about, well, what did that sound like to the religious authorities? That probably sounded like Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, right? And so I, I don't think um, uh, Jesus was in the middle. And I think there can be this way of conflating thoughtfulness with being in the middle. And I think we can also overly glorify being in the middle. And uh, as a lesbian woman who was not um, acceptable when I first came into the Lutheran church and was seeking ordination, uh, there, I heard a lot of times people were saying, oh, well, you know, the people you know, like you were on one side and then you've got the other, the word alone people on the other side. And I felt like there was kind of supposedly this moral high ground for being in the middle. And I don't think standing in the middle and just standing for the status quo is necessarily the high ground. It depends on what the issue is. And so um, I've actually been uh, over the last few weeks trying to read um, two very different sources of news myself. Uh, it, as opposed to trying to find something, uh, I think the week, uh, when I read the week, that's maybe more kind of in the middle and there's less of a, it's more about, well, here's what the, what the folks on one side are saying, here's what the folks on the other side are saying. But I'm just like trying to read CNN and Fox News or watch something on CNN and watch something on Fox News. And it is, a, as you know, a totally different take on reality. But to try, I want to try to understand the different frames. And, and when hearing a perspective very different than the one I tend to go towards, that actually encourages me towards thoughtfulness, right? Because it helps me see the limits of some of the frame that I'm in by, by hearing what the challenges or the critique uh, coming from a different news source. So, so just to go back to that concept, uh, what I hear, you can be a zealot 
for the middle truth, so to speak. <laughs> so there's, uh, it, is, it is the 1045, uh, just a couple final remarks. Uh, Bonhoeffer, when he's involved in a conspiracy to assassinate the head of the state, um, nobody wants to claim him. Uh, not, not on the left, not on the right, not in the middle. Um, and uh, so in that sense, he was uh, just, and he uses the term uh, with, with his fellow conspirators that there's, it's as if there is no ground under our feet for what we're doing. And that's a real challenge to, to, uh, to do that then and to even dare to think you're doing, doing a truthful thing or you know, speaking wasn't the issue there in that case. It was uh, doing a truthful thing. Um, so we just have to, uh, that in those kinds of extraordinary situations, and hopefully most of us will not obviously have to face that kind of thing, but undoubtedly we'll face something in our lives where it's a real challenge and people may doubt, doubt us and to do the, do the truthful thing or speak the truthful word is, is truly a challenge. And that's where I say, I'm really glad we have a strong doctrine of grace in our evangelical Lutheran church. At our best, you know, we emphasize that, so that when we dare to speak a word or dare to do something, um, we do that knowing that God is not going to ultimately reject us. Um, God will judge what we do and carry forward that which is, needs to be carried forward, leave behind that which needs to be left behind. But finally, we have a gracious God, and God's love for us doesn't depend on us speaking the perfect word. Yes, we're called to speak that truthful word in whatever situation we're in, but finally we have a God who uh, continues to love us even in the midst of that, and it's wonderful to be a part of a community that we're, or a, a family or a community of people that will accept us as we uh, go through life seeking to both speak and do uh, the truth. So next, uh, next week, uh, we're going to deal with the question uh, Bonhoeffer talks about the ultimate res responsible question is, is how will the next generation go on living? And so I want to lift up that question and what that might mean for us as we prepare, uh, go through this election season and prepare to vote uh, can influence that. It's certainly an important question we need to face even more pronounced in some ways now with climate change and so on. You know, how will the next generation go on living? Uh, so we'll take a look look at that. And then one the last comment I want to make, because voting is, I know we've got several efforts going on for people dealing with the whole idea of the vote. Um, part of truthfulness is even deciding when you're ready to speak the truthful word. And sometimes we can't wait, and so we have to speak. Uh, there's something wonderful about voting is, Finally, there is an election day and you have to vote. Here in Oregon, though, we actually have to decide when we're gonna vote because we all vote by mail. And so are you gonna do it three weeks ahead of time, two weeks ahead of time? Don't lose any sleep about this, but you may need an extra week to get ready to vote. And so uh, utilize the time you need. And then when you're ready, go ahead and vote, but make sure that vote is in the mail or where it needs to be by November 3rd. Take care, everybody. That church for Zoom church starts in about 10 minutes. Thank you so much.